Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to our worship service this morning. We give a special welcome to our visitors. If you're new in the Springfield Clark County area or looking for a new church home, we invite you to make St. John your new church home. In regards to our worship service, a couple of changes. Uh, when it comes to the song, we will not sing the song today because the choir's anthem is the 23rd Psalm, so they will sing their anthem in between the first and second lesson. So in the first lesson, the choir will sing their anthem based on Psalm 23, then the second lesson, then the gospel. Uh, after the gospel, we will have the young people dismissed for Children's Church, and then in place of special music, uh, once again, we are blessed to have Dorothy Ayers going to share her talent with us singing a special song in the place of special music. So those are some changes uh, for the worship service this morning. At this time, our president, uh, Mr. Nelson Smith, would like to share a few words of thanks for the garage sale and some other upcoming events. Thank you, Pastor. You already heard on this end. We would like to, uh, the, the committee that worked on the garage sale this last weekend, uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, uh, we made $2,475.10. Uh, we missed uh, Marty's goal by about $25. He wanted to make $2,500. $2, we did very well. Uh, the uh, raffle was won by Hunter Clark. Uh, it was a $250 gift certificate to Myers, and uh, he has to go to one of his competitors then to uh, claim his money, or buy what he wants. Uh, it's uh, good to see this good crowd here for Mother's Day. I did want to let you know also that uh, through some efforts of uh, members, some of the members of the church, mostly Marty, that we are going to have a booth at the fair this summer uh, in July, at the end of July. Out a schedule that we would like members to sign up for to volunteer to work at the fair. There'll probably be a two hour, two to three hour shift uh, for the five or six days of the fair. Uh, we will have somebody set it up in the mornings and we'll probably run some of the, maybe some of the sermons or some of the uh, activities at the church on a DVD and then uh, we'll shut that down at night each night. Uh, to make sure that all you have to do is turn it on and come out and work. And it will be a continuous running affair. And then we'll have it decorated. And what we're trying to do is sponsor what this church is about, what our ministries are about, and to invite the community to come here and share uh, their worship with us. And thank you very much, Pastor, for all that you do for the church. Uh, we, we appreciate you uh, continuing to stay here and share <coughs> God's love with all of you. Thank you, Mr. This is just the observance of Mother's Day. As also in the church calendar, this is Good Shepherd Sunday from the tradition of the fourth Sunday of Easter each year reading Jesus telling us how he is our Good Shepherd. So we celebrate both today. We prepare for that worship with the order of confession and forgiveness on page 94 in the front of your red hymnal. So I'd ask that you please turn to page 94 and I invite those who can with that difficulty to please stay. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, 
by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Let us now begin our worship by singing, When Peace Like a River, hymn number 785. Welcome to St. John's Wisdom Church, Springfield, Ohio, with the corner of 27 North Wittenberg Avenue, corner of Wittenberg and Columbia. We invite you to worship with us. This is our 1030 service. This is the fourth Sunday of Easter. We're commemorating Good Shepherd Sunday, and also we're commemorating the Mother's Day. This is May the 11th, 2014, Mother's Day. This hymn is written by Horatio uh, Spaccio, who was a uh, lawyer, and he uh, sent his children on a ship. The ship sank, his wife was saved, his daughters died. He went back over the same place, and he wrote that hymn and peace like a river to show his peace that he accepted the death of his daughters. He knew that he would see them someday when peace like a river. Our pastor is Pastor John Pollock. We have our choir directed by Vicki Perks. We'll have special music by Dorothy Ayers.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also be here. Now we have the prayer of the day. Smith is reading your scripture today. The theme is God is our good shepherd, Jesus is our shepherd, the shepherd theme for this Sunday. The first reading is from the second chapter of Acts. The baptized devoted themselves to the apostles, teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. All came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell the possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number to those who were being saved. The word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. 
just heard the choir singing the 23rd Psalm. Now we'll have the gospel acclamation. After the reading. pulpit to show our great respect for the gospel and he's reading the gospel message for today. The theme is the shepherd We're singing our gospel acclamation.
Dorothy Ayers is going to sing a solo. She's the daughter of Bill and Susan Ayers, granddaughter of James and Sally Pompousas. Her, her mother, Susan Ayers, grew up in this church. This song is a favorite song. Pastor Glazer, our former pastor, his eye is on the sparrow. First chapter of first 
understanding. And we begin, uh, and I'm going to skip some of the unimportant parts, so if you're following along, uh, don't, that's why, uh, because it takes too long to read all of it. But we begin, it says, now there was a certain man of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah. And he had two wives. The name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had no children. This man went up from his city yearly to worship and sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Also the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And whenever the time came for Elkanah to make an offering, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. So it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord that she provoked that she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Then Elkanah her husband said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? So Hannah rose after they had finished eating and drinking and shouting. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the infliction of your maid servant and remember me and not forget your maid servant, but will give your maid servant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord in all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. And it happened as she continued praying before the Lord that Eli washed her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, How long will you be drunk? Put your wine away from me. But Hannah answered and said, No, my Lord, I am a woman of sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor intoxicating drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. Do not consider your maidservant a wicked woman. For out of the abundance of my complaint and grief, I have spoken until now. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition which you have asked of him. And she said, Let your maidservant find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. So it came to pass in the process of time that Hannah conceived and bore a son, and called his name Samuel, saying, Because I have asked for him from the Lord. Now when she had weaned him, she took him up with her and brought him to the house of the Lord in Shiloh, and the child was young. And she brought the child to Eli, and she said, Oh, my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood by you here praying to the Lord. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition, which I asked of him. Therefore I also have led him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he shall be led to the Lord. So they worship the Lord there. Abraham Lincoln expressed it so well when he said, quote, No one is poor who has a godly mother. In quote. Today, although our society has changed much from the days of Hannah, although we are not exactly in the same situation, the foundations for being a godly Christian woman, for being a godly Christian mother, are the same today as they were as illustrated by Hannah. Even though times change, certain things stay the same. And it should be the motivation and desire of every Christian woman to be that godly woman. <coughs> because as you well know, just like a man can be a Christian man but not a godly man, there are Christian women who are not godly Christian women. But you should strive to be so. Because at the beginning of creation, God set up the office of husband and wife, and then set up the office of mother and father. And the idea of mother and father is so important to God, it's not an accident, it's not something that just evolved, it was God set up this office. And it's so important that when he gives Moses the Ten Commandments, after the first three commandments, which deal with our relationship to God, I am the Lord your God, you shall know other gods, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God, may you remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. The very next commandment, the very first one that deals with our relationship with each other is honor your father and mother. 
give weight to, that's what the word honor means in Hebrew, give weight to, be in awe of, to give respect to, to listen to. So the office of mother and father is that important to God. And so everyone who is blessed with being a mother and father should strive to be that godly Christian woman. And every aunt and every sister, every other Christian woman who may not be a mother still should strive to be that godly Christian woman in the example of Hannah. So how is Hannah a godly woman? What does she give us as an illustration to follow and to be pattern your life after? The first thing is that Hannah was a woman of prayer. Remember, we're told that Hannah was the second wife of Elkanah, that she was there, <laughs> that Peninnah had many sons and daughters, and Peninnah would always throw it up in Hannah's face that she was bigger. And in the days of the Old Testament, when a woman could not bear children, a lot of people thought it had something to do with that woman being sinful or having to disobey God in some way or having to anger God in some way. And so when Hannah feels that she is below Hannah, she doesn't feel like she is being a good wife to Elkanah. Yet Elkanah loves her the most. And he gives her more than he gives to Penelope and her children. And so when we read that after the feast, Hannah went to the tabernacle. And remember, this is the time period before the kingdom. This is before Saul, this is before David, this is before Solomon the the temple. So at this point, Israel still worships in the tabernacle. The same tabernacle that the instructions on how to build it were given to Moses while the Hebrew children were in the wilderness, in which they set up in the wilderness. And so she goes to the tabernacle to pray. She doesn't just pray, she prays fervently. She prays with perseverance. She empties out her whole heart in prayer. The writer of the first Samuel tells us she was in bitterness of soul. The Hebrew word bitterness means a heart-crushing experience from family turmoil. It means a heart full of sadness, a heart full of hardship, a heart that is heavy because of some situation or another. The word prayer in this case means not to simply praise God or to praise His name. It means to petition God, to be offering intercessions to God, to be asking of God. Now, one thing I've never understood, I had a seminary classmate like this. And one until he finally finished his four years of seminary, he finally got it right. But on entering seminary, for some reason, he had been brought up with the idea that we weren't supposed to ask God of any, anything of God. That it was being a bad Christian to ask God for something. Yet Jesus himself tells us to ask of the Father in his name. And so there are some Christians that think, that petitional prayer is wrong or intercessory. But here we have Hannah pouring her heart out to God, asking him that she might have a son. So she gives us that example of someone praying and praying and praying. And the prayers of a godly Christian woman can accomplish much. Two examples. The first is Monica. Monica lived in North Africa in the 3rd century AD. Her husband was a pagan Roman official. She gave birth to a son whom she tried to raise in the church, but he would have nothing to do with it. He turned his back on it and instead pursued rhetoric and philosophy and women and good times. He went off family on his own and went to Italy. North Africa to Italy. And he began to teach and learn more about rhetoric and philosophy and continued to chase women and so forth. And then one day he happened to go into the cathedral of Milan, which was the seat of the bishop. And he listened to the bishop of Milan preach. And as we confessed in that explanation to the third article of the creed, the Holy Spirit called him through the gospel. 
He heard the Lord calling him as he listened to the Bishop of Milan preaching that good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This young man totally changed his life. He became a Christian, but he didn't stop there. He then became a priest. He didn't stop there. He became a bishop. He didn't stop there. He became the greatest non-apostolic theologian of the church. You had Peter, you had Paul, you had John, and then you had St. Augustine. St. Augustine was the son of Monica, the mother of North Africa in the 3rd century AD, who was spending a life of carousing and drinking and woman chasing and rhetoric and philosophy, who was changed by the preaching of St. Ambrose another doctor of the church. Changed and changed him so much that his theological insights influenced not only Martin Luther, but continues to influence the church today. <coughs> Monica never gave up praying for her husband and her son, and later on, her husband would become a Christian as well. Second example comes to us from the 18th century, the 1700s. Woman had a son whom she prayed for from the day he was born. But as the son grew up, he became more rebellious and more honorable. At 15, he ran away from home, headed out to a life at sea, coming to sea. He was so wicked that his father even disowned him. But the mother continued to pray. She continued to pray and cease him, that the Lord would reach her her son. And at the age of 54, this wicked Satan became a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. He went from being a wicked sailor to a sailor preacher. But that's not why we know him. The reason we know him is because he wrote what many consider to be the national anthem of the Christian faith. A mighty fortress is the anthem of the Reformation. This song is considered the national anthem of Christianity. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. That wicked teenager, that wicked Satan, that 54 year old wicked adult who suddenly submitted to the Lord Jesus Christ. Was John Newton, the author of Amazing Grace. The mothers would not quit praying for their children. So a godly Christian woman is a woman who prays continually. If you have a child, if you have a grandchild, if you have a niece or nephew that seems to be going down the wrong path, don't stop praying for them. Just because they're whatever age they are, don't quit praying. Continue to pray because you do not know the power of continual prayer. Prayer that is unceasing. Now that doesn't mean that only mothers and Christian women are pray for sons and daughters and spouses and others. Everybody. Should. Fathers should pray for their children as well. Pray for their wives. Children should pray for their brothers and sisters and their parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles and so forth. But women have been given, it seems like, this special place in the kingdom of God to pray unceasingly and to have that prayer become a reality. So the first example of what a godly Christian woman is that we would learn from Hannah is a godly Christian woman, a godly Christian mother is a woman of prayer. Those of you who been here for a long time. Recall last fall, those of you who weren't around last fall, uh, I'll explain the story too, but you recall last fall, one Saturday morning, I received a phone call from my older sister that my mother had been rushed to the hospital. And as it went on, we discovered that my mother had fallen in her garage on a Wednesday afternoon and that she was not discovered until that Saturday morning. She'd gone from Wednesday until Saturday without food or water. She couldn't be 
get up. She kept hollering for help, and nobody heard her. But some miracle Saturday morning in the neighbor valley heard her. Called 911 when they couldn't get into the house. Of course, then the police, paramedics, and firemen came, had to bust down her front door. They found her in the garage. After a time in the hospital and was rehab, she came out as good as new. As you know, she was with us on Christmas Eve when we celebrated the birth of Christ. Two weeks ago, when Gina and I went on vacation after Easter, we drove down to Lowell and picked Mom up. She went up with us to Griffith to see Katie's First Communion. She's now 90 years old, still drives, still takes communion to shut-ins, still works in the kitchen at church, still plays the bridge with her friends. I've had people ask me, how did your mother do it? How did she survive? How did she go through that ordeal of, of being there? Uh, from Wednesday to Saturday, not really being able to know whether it was daytime or nighttime, because a garage door is one of those solid ones that doesn't have windows, or a garage has no windows. <coughs> I said there are three reasons why my mother survived. So one, she's a woman of faith. Two, she's a woman of prayer. And third, she's a stubborn old German. <laughs> I said that's why she survived. That's how she was able to overcome that belief. And so the Christian woman, the godly Christian woman, the godly Christian mother is a woman of prayer just like Hannah. The Bible doesn't tell us how old Hannah was. Not like with Sarah and Abraham where they tell us that Abraham was over 100 years old and Sarah was in her 90s when God gives them Abraham, uh, gives them Isaac. But Hannah was obviously had been married for quite a while, yet that persistent prayer, her prayer is answered. Samuel is dedicated to God and becomes a servant in the tabernacle. So the second thing we learn from Hannah about a godly Christian woman is that besides being a woman of prayer, she's a woman of promise. We heard how Hannah, after his son was born, after she had weaned him, and I don't know back in the bounds of B.C. whether they quit weaning a child of a year, year and a half, two years, uh, but somewhere in that age group, she then fulfills that vow. She takes him to the priest to consecrate him to God. The word vow, the Hebrew word literally means to consecrate something to God, to perform something, to make something, or to abstain from something out of devotion to God. Now, people make promises to God all the time. People make vows to God all the time. But they don't always back them up. I'm sure we've all known somebody who got into a difficult situation. Maybe they were injured, maybe they had a serious surgery, maybe they were fighting a serious illness. Maybe they were facing bankruptcy, losing their business, whatever. And they made a vow, oh Lord, if you get me through this, I'll go to church every Sunday. I'll tithe and give my offerings. I'll become involved in the church and let them use me wherever they need me. And then what happens? They become healed, or their business is saved, or they're cured, or whatever the situation was me, cause them to make a vow. We don't see it. When it comes time to put their action, their words into action, it's not there. We may see them at Christmas and Easter or one or the other. But what if that person said, I'm going to be in church every Sunday? I'm going to give my time and my offer. I'm going to <coughs> volunteer for the church for wherever they need. But Hannah was a woman who fulfilled her. She was a woman who took that young son. Now remember, she has been praying and praying for a son all this long period of time, whatever it was. She has prayed for that son, and yet at one or one and a half, two years old, she takes him to Eli the priest to dedicate him to be a Nazarene. That's what the gentleman said, no razor would touch his head. In the Old Testament, men could take a vow to become a Nazarene. In that vow, they would abstain from hard drink and they would not cut their hair. 
Samson was a Nazarene, but a lot was he violated the fact. This is not talking about Nazarene the way we talk about Jesus being the Nazarene because he was from Nazareth. This was a special group, kind of like in the Orthodox and Catholic churches, people going into a monastery and becoming a brother, women going into a nunnery and becoming a nun. You were dedicating your life to service to God. Hannah, had she backed off on that promise, we couldn't have, we wouldn't have blamed her. Oh, this was her only child. She had waited for it. Yet she was a woman of promise. She was so devoted to God that she would not let that love for her child stop her from fulfilling that vow. Now, I'm sure she was able to still see Sam, but he was being raised by Eli in the tabernacle to be a priest and servant of God. Now, every child is not asked to be consecrated to God. But mothers still and aunts and grandmothers and sisters can still set an example by fulfilling the promises they make to God and by living a life of devoted service to God. Setting that example so others might see it. <coughs> G. Campbell Morgan was a famous British evangelist, preacher, and Bible scholar. Born in 1863 and he was called to the church triumphant in 1945. He had four sons. All four sons became preachers. Now they never were quite the preacher that daddy was, but they were all very successful in their own right. They had the London area and the surrounding area. Well, one day the Morgan family had a celebration at their home and they invited some of their friends there. After they had a nice dinner, they all retired to the den. There was G. Campbell Morgan, the father, and his four sons, the preachers, the rest of the family. And one of the friends asked a question. He said, which of you is the greatest preacher in the family? Now, all four sons admired their father greatly. But the oldest son, Howard, answered the question. Looking at his father, he responded without hesitation. The greatest preacher in our family is mother. That is the effect that a woman who is a woman of promise can have on her family. She can be the greatest preacher in a house full of ordained preachers. She can be the greatest preacher even in the presence of a Billy Graham or a Billy Sunday or a C.A. Spurgeon or a D.L. Newton. See, a woman of promise. A woman who lives that life in service and devotion to God has more of an influence on others than she does. Hannah was a mother of prayer and a mother of promise. And she serves as an example for all Christian women, for all Christian godly women, whether a mother or not. She serves as an example for you to follow. So it's important for Christian women to be godly Christian women, to be mothers of prayer and mothers of promise. Set an example for their children, for their husbands, for their nieces and nephews, for their brothers and sisters, for their co-workers, for all of them whom they come and come. And on this Mother's Day, the greatest gift a child can give their mother, the greatest gift a husband can give his wife, is to acknowledge the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Follow the woman's example of being a person of prayer and promise to the Lord Jesus Christ and to devote their life to Christ. You know, Christian women are godly Christian women like Hannah and women of prayer and women of promise. Then they will receive many such gifts in their life as they see many come to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Amen. Peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us now sing Blessed Assurance in number 600. Blessed, Blessed Assurance, Assurance is written by Fanny Crosby, a blind hymn writer from the United States. She went into her friend's apartment. Her friend was playing this melody to Blessed Assurance. 
and she was inspired to write the words that very day. Her friend was Phoebe Knapp. The hymn was sung by, it was written by the blind hymn writer, Fanny Crosby, Blessed Assurance. And our theme today is Mother's Day and the Good Shepherd. It's St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio. The date is May the 11th, 2014. bring the offering place up. The uh, ushers today are Caroline and Ralph Stickford will be receiving the offering. This is St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio, May the 11th, 2014, Mother's Day, and also the theme is the theme of the Good Shepherd. You see Caroline and Ralph coming forward, receive the offering place. You'll hear Greg Nolte playing the offertory in the background. Greg Nolte is our organist. We're at the corner of Wittenberg and Columbia. We invite you to come join with us, worship any Sundays. 8 o'clock, our drive-in services will start on the 25th of May 
at Melody Cruise Inn Drive-In. It'll be 8 o'clock service. Our 1030 service will continue in the sanctuary just as you're watching and participating in the services today. Our pastor is Pastor Pollock. The music director is Vicki Perks. You have heard Pastor Pollock leading the service today. And you're now listening to the organ playing as Greg Dolte is playing the offertory. Caroline and Ralph Stickford are taking up the offering. We will then bring the offering forward. And after that, we will continue our service. We have confessed our sins to God as we're, we are commanded to do this for four others every Sunday and we do this. We have made a profession of faith, which is the Apostles' Creed, giving our offering, confessing our love for God and for one another. This is what we must do to be saved. Also, on Communion Sundays, we receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ. We obtain eternal life through this, as Jesus has established this for us through his death on the cross. by a woman who wrote children's 
hymns. And the melody was written by Ray Bradbury and Catherine Thrump. And they're a little more peppy than your average hymns written for children. Thank you for watching our video. This will either be on cable channel 3 and count channel 23 until the 1st of June. After that, we'll be on our website where you can tune in anytime. We're happy to bring you this service each Sunday. Our church offers a Christian school program. For more information, you may call the school office. Tune in anytime next Sunday on channel 23 if it's before June, June the 1st or before. We hope that God will continue to bless you and keep you this day. We pray for you. We'll be glad you're listening to our video. We're watching the acolyte. She is extinguishing the candles. The choir will profess out. This is May the 11th. St. John's Lutheran Church, we're happy to have you watch our video.